Welcome to Data Structures with Professor Taylor. Today I'd like to talk about Dijkstra's algorithm. So one of the things we're often interested in is finding a shortest path with weighted edges in the graph. So these weights might represent distances, they might represent costs of some kind, they might represent time in travel, lots of different possibilities. As we think about how to do this, we know that breadth for search worked great for our unweighted edges. So if every edge has exactly the same cost, breadth for search is guaranteed to get us the shortest path. However, it does not guarantee a shortest path if our edges are weighted. So let's take a look at an example here. We have a graph very similar to the graph that we used for the unweighted case but in this case, we've added weights. If we use breadth for search, then it's going to pick the path from A to G. But we note that if we're paying attention to the costs, we have a better option from A to C to G. It may only require one edge to get from A to G directly, but the cost is seven while the two edges to get from A to C to G cost five. Our solution to this is to use Dijkstra's algorithm. This was created by Edsger Dijkstra, a brilliant computer scientist. I once had the opportunity to watch him give a talk on the meaning of equality. Fascinating, fascinating talk, fascinating man. He has created multiple algorithms that we continue to use today. And one of those is this algorithm named for him that guarantees finding the shortest weighted path as long as we don't have any negative weights. And for most purposes where we need a shortest path, we don't have negative weights. This is going to require data very similar to the data we needed for our unweighted situation. We're going to need our representation of the graph, we're going to need an array to keep track of the path cost, the array to keep track of the previous vertex because we're going to construct the actual path in exactly the same way that we do for our unweighted situation. And then we'll need an array to keep track of whether we found a path to that vertex. So basically all of the things that we had before, except that we don't need a queue in this case. We'll be keeping track of the information we need to pick what is the shortest path in the array itself. Now in my next video, I'm gonna talk about a way to actually use a priority queue to improve the performance of Dijkstra's on larger graphs. So the basic process that we're going to use is this. We'll initialize all our costs to infinity or the best approximation we have of infinity given our implementation. We're going to update our arrays with information about edges out of the source. We're gonna to say to begin with the best we know about the vertices that are directly connected to our source is that they come from the source with the cost of that edge. Then we're gonna go into our loop. While we have non-infinite costs for paths where we haven't confirmed a path, then we're going to pick the vertex with the smallest cost out of all of those that don't have paths confirmed. We're gonna say, okay, this path we're going to pick. Then for each edge out of that vertex, we're going to update our array information. But as we update the information, we're going to need to check to make sure that the cost of going to this node through this vertex is cheaper than the cost we currently have recorded. So let's go through our example, see if we can make sure we understand this. So we start out by simply taking all of our costs and setting them to infinity, except for our source where we're not gonna be concerned about a path to our source. Then we're going to go through the edges out of our source, which in this case, we're again doing A. So we have an edge from A to C. So we're gonna mark that we can get to C from A for two. Have the edge from A to G. So we mark that we get from A to G for seven. 
and the same with B from A for four. Now we're gonna check our loop condition. We're not done. We keep going. We're going to go through our array. Now notice we have to go through all the items in the array, checking for where's the shortest one that we haven't confirmed the path. And so in this case, that's going to be C from A for two. So we confirm that path, we're done with C, never gonna change our minds, we're never gonna find a better path to C at this point. So then we start looking at our edges. Of course, there's nothing to do from C to A. From C to F, we're going to now record that we can get to F through C at a total cost of 10. So that's the eight for this edge, plus the two it took to get to C. Do the same for G, where we see that we had a cost of seven. Our total cost through C is gonna be the two to get to C plus three for this edge, so that's five. That's better, so we're going to replace the cost with five and replace the A with C. That was all our edges out of C. So now we check our loop conditions. We're not done yet. So we find our next smallest path. And that's gonna be 2B through A for four. So now we need to start checking edges out of B. Of course, there's nothing to do on the way to A. With the edge from B to D, we're going to record in our table that we can get to D through B for six. That covers our edges from B. So we're gonna check our loop conditions. We're not done yet. So our next smallest path, our next shortest path, smallest cost, is to G through C for five. So now we update using those edges. So nothing to do from G to C or G to A. We get to G to D, we see that the current cost to D that we have recorded in the table is six. We could get to D for 10, that is not smaller than our current cost, so we don't change anything in the array. So then finally, we handle the edge from G to J, and here we didn't have anything recorded, so we update the array to show that we can get to J from G for nine, the five to get to G plus four for this edge. We check our loop conditions. And the next path we're going to check is D from B for six, since that's the smallest thing we have that we haven't confirmed yet. So then we go through our edges out of D. We don't do anything about B, it's already in our table. Same for G, H, we now add to the array the information we can get to H from D for 12, six plus six. That covered our edges out of D, so now we check our loop conditions, we're still not done. We now go through our array and discover that the shortest path we have available is the path to J from G for nine. So now we start checking the edges for J. Now with F, nine plus three is 12. We currently can get to F for 10, so we don't change what we have in the array. We check G, of course, that's already recorded, so we're done. Don't need to do anything about that one. And then when we get to H, we did have 12 from D, nine plus two is 11, so we're gonna update the array to be from J for 11 instead of from D for 12. And that was all our edges out of J. We check our loop conditions, still not done. So the next path we're going to deal with is the one to F for 10. The edges out of that aren't going to make any changes. We've already got C, we've already got J. Check our loop conditions again. We still have one vertex we haven't found a path to. We note that that's the shortest path we can get to H. And at this point, we're done because we found paths to all our vertices. 
We could also be done because we had something that we were never able to change from infinity and we have paths to all the non-infinite options. So at this point, our algorithm is complete. We would now, if we need to provide this in human readable form or give an actual path to an algorithm, we're going to use the exact same process to go back through our previous vertices to find the path that we use with our unweighted graphs. So if you're not clear on how to do that, I recommend that you watch that section of the unweighted shortest paths video. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time when I'll be talking about how to implement Dijkstra's more efficiently for very large graphs, especially using a priority queue.